there's the fact that we are streamlined. Try to imagine a diver diving into water, hardly makes a splash. Try to imagine a gorilla performing the same maneuver. And you can see that compared with gorilla, we are halfway to being shaped like a fish. Actually, humans aren't streamlined and consequently are very, very poor swimmers even compared to modern semi-aquatic species. Polar bears, for example, can swim about 20 to 50 percent faster and for far longer than is humanly possible, and even they don't do that well in water. Also, web digits can also occur in other apes and are simply remnants of cells retained during embryonic development, which fuse the digits together and are not atavisms. Um, there are other weird things as well. We've got all these kind of breathing control differences. I mean, my nose, like most noses, is like a beak. It's pointing down. The nostrils are inferiorly orientated, and it kind of makes sense in a swimming uh, environment. Now, this is an exceptionally bad argument. One of the characteristics of being an old world monkey is having downward facing nostrils unlike the new world monkeys whose face sideways. This is especially obvious in humans whose noses are very variable and appear to have simply followed the changes with an increasingly flat face. Note that this is the opposite trend seen in aquatic mammals whose noses have migrated superiorly. This reduction in size of the face is also part of the reason why our olfaction is reduced relative to other apes. Another reason why this is a poor argument is because humans can't close their nostrils when underwater, unlike marine mammals like manatees, whose nostrils close automatically when being submerged. And this is one of the first characteristics in that lineage to evolve before they acquired even more aquatic characteristics. The question of why we can speak. We can speak, and the, and the gorilla can't speak. Why? Nothing to do with his teeth or his tongue or his lungs or anything like that. Purely to do... Uh, with its conscious control of its breath. You can't even train a, a gorilla to say, ah, on request. The only creatures that have got conscious control of their breath are the diving animals and the diving birds. It was an absolute precondition for our being able to speak. That is incorrect. All mammals have to some degree control over their breath, and this pre-adaptive character has simply been refined in humans, which allows us to speak. Further, Morgan is wrong about the descent of the larynx. As I said earlier, the differences between men and other apes are due primarily to differences in development, which make us, in a sense, analogous to oversized juvenile chimpanzees. When comparing the third ontogeny between the two, the larynx descends in infant chimps and humans after birth. However, later, it migrates in chimps, but the lower position is retained in humans for improved vocalization and later in development full speech. But then, in the 90s, something began to unravel the paleontologists themselves looked a bit more closely at the accompanying microfauna that lived in the same time and place as the hominids. And they weren't savanna species. And they looked at the herbivores, and they weren't savanna herbivores. And then they were so clever, they found a way to analyze fossilized pollen. Shock horror. The fossilized pollen was not of savanna vegetation. Some of it even came from lianas, those things that dangle in the middle of the jungle. So we're left with a situation where we know that our earliest ancestors were running around on four legs in the trees before the savannah ecosystem even came into existence. First off, Morgan clearly doesn't know how a savanna is defined or is simply being disingenuous. Second, paleoecological and geologic studies have demonstrated that starting at the end of the Miocene, the Earth's climate change becoming cooler leading to less evaporation and consequently less rainfall turning the once lush forests at the edges of Africa into savannas. The effects of this trend are reflected in the adaptation to open conditions at the beginning of the Pliocene as can be seen in the most primitive hominine bipeds, the Artipithecines, which are associated with open forest and savanna habitat. Later in the Pliocene, when the Australopiths emerged, the environment was very mixed, but overall less forested and dominated by tropical grasslands. And around the time the first humans evolved, Africa was uncovered in increasingly arid savanna. Regardless of whether we're talking about hominines found in grasslands or in mildly wooded areas, none of the earliest bipeds are found near ancient seaways as aquatic supporters have suggested in the past. More evidence for an increasingly savanna-type habitat and against the idea of aquatic apes is in the study of fossil teeth. For example, the studies of the Artipithecines dentition indicates that most of their food came from forests, while the Graceful Australopithecus had a varied diet including hard nuts, fruits, tubers, and roots of mixed habitat origin. 
Early human teeth display signs that their diet was even wider and included meat, while even more modern humans display a more modern diet with increased meat consumption. This is supported by early stone tools, which are commonly associated with cut-up fossil deer and kudu and other savanna animals. Now, to be fair, the earliest evidence for hominins consuming aquatic fauna was found in a site in northern Kenya, dated to be 1.95 million years old. However, this is hundreds of thousands of years after the emergence of humans, initial expansion of the brain, as well as the first indications of rudimentary speech and stone tool manufacturing, making it inconsistent with aquatic ape supporters' notion that the marine diet had anything to do with these changes. How do they react when I say these things? One very common reaction I've heard about 20 times is, but it was investigated. They conducted a serious investigation of this at the beginning when Hardy put forward his article. I don't believe it. For 35 years I've been looking for any evidence of any incident of that kind, and I've concluded that that's one of the urban myths. It's never been done. It's going to come and it's going to happen. What's holding it up? I can tell you that in three words. Academia says no. They decided in 1960 that belongs with the UFOs and the Yetis and it's not easy to change their minds. The professional journals won't touch it with a barge pole. The textbooks don't mention it. The syllabus doesn't mention even the fact that we're naked, let alone for, look for a reason to it. Horizon, which takes its cue from the academics, won't touch it with a barge pole. So we never hear the case put for it, except in jocular references to people on a lunatic fringe. I don't know quite where this diktat comes from. Somebody up there is issuing the commandment, thou shalt not believe in the quadratic theory. And if you hope to make progress in this profession and you do believe it, you better keep it to yourself because it will get in your way. So I get the impression that some parts of the scientific established are sort of morphing into a kind of priesthood. The problem with the aquatic ape hypothesis is the way it's argued. We scientists are always going to be the bad guys in this one. We're arguing against uh, people who are almost uh, pursuing this as if it's a religion. Um, if we say it's not, well, it's a scientific conspiracy. If we tell you that the morphology of the bones are not suitable for exhibiting any ancestry of an aquatic organism, well, it's a scientific conspiracy. We're not open to new ideas. It's not that good of an idea. It's not based on testable scientific philosophy that for 40 odd years this aquatic idea has been miscategorized as lunatic fringe and it is not lunatic fringe and the ironic thing about it is that they are not staving off the aquatic theory to protect a theory of their own which they all agreed on and they love there is nothing there they're staving off the aquatic theory to protect a vacuum now we've got to look to the future ultimately one of three things is going to happen either they will go on for the next 40 years 50 years 60 years yeah well we don't talk about that let's talk about something interesting that would be very sad the second thing that could happen is that some young genius will arrive and say I've solved it it was not the savanna it was not the water it was this no sign of that happening either I don't think there's a third option so the third thing that might happen is a very beautiful thing. If you look back at the early years of the last century, there was a standoff and a lot of bickering and bad feeling between the believers in Mendel and the believers in Darwin. It ended with a new synthesis. Darwin's ideas and Mendel's ideas blending together. And I think the same thing will happen here. You get a new synthesis. Hardy's ideas and Darwin's ideas will be blended together and we can go forward from there and really get somewhere. That would be a beautiful thing. 
In order for science to move forward, scientists have to be open to new possibilities, which must be routinely tested and open to falsifiability. The Savannah model has won the consensus of the scientific community after decades of critique, refinement, and the scrutiny of peer review. And there are competing hypotheses to refine or even replace the Savannah model should new evidence be presented. However, the aquatic ape hypothesis and all variants thereof aren't one of them. Anything it gets by right, it does by chance, and all the rest of the evidence in favor of it is either inconsistent with its own scenario, or is misunderstood or even misrepresented by its supporters. So what to do with it? I think Morgan put it best. The aquatic theory should be dumped with the UFOs and the Yetis as part of the lunatic fringe of science.